Thank you to Timothy Masson for those remarks to kick us off today. Next up is the panel, Traditional and Evolving Functions of the Financial System, Payments as a Utility, moderated by our own Michael Barr. Live Q&A is available for this session, so please submit any questions through the Engagement Hub for registered attendees under the Day 2 live stream. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next panel on payment systems as a utility. It's my great honor uh, to be able to uh, lead this discussion, moderate this discussion with distinguished guests. Again, I'm Michael Barr, uh, the Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. My panelists uh, today include Andrea Dunlop, who's the Managing Director of Payments for the Access Group, uh, Chair of the Emergent Payments Association Advisory Board, and a member of European Women in Payments Network. We have Tillman Urbach, Managing Partner for Flourish Ventures, a formerly partner at Omidyar Network, where he built the Global Financial Inclusion Team, and the former CEO of CGAP, the consultative group to assist the poor. And we have Musa Etopa Jimo, Director of the Payment Systems Management Department for the Central Bank of Nigeria, an experienced leader in public and private sector issues in banking, in, uh, in engineering, and in software. I'm really delighted to have all three of you today for this discussion uh, on payment systems. You know, for some people, uh, payment systems may seem like a dry issue. Uh, but I think it's really actually not. It's one of the most exciting issues, I think, in finance today. And uh, more importantly, it's a key to consumer autonomy, to uh, access uh, to the financial system. It's really the backbone of the system. And in many ways, uh, it is uh, helping us to find in each society who's in the system and who's not in the system who is part of the financial uh, uh, system and who, who is denied access. So payments are really, really quite critical. And I'm thrilled that we have Andrea Tillman and Musa here uh, to help us work through these issues. Uh, I might start um, with just a question for each of you. Uh, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, many countries around the world use the payment system in their own countries to uh, try and get government benefit payments to individuals affected by the pandemic. And I'm wondering what you've seen that has worked uh, and what has not worked. And what does that tell us about the state of the payment systems in those countries uh, that you want to talk about? And, and we, don't, we don't have to be comprehensive, but just uh, to get a look. And maybe I'll start uh, Tillman with you and then I'll ask uh, Musa to answer, and finally, Andrea. Yeah, thank you, Michael and uh, colleagues, for <clears throat> having me today. Great, uh, great pleasure. Absolutely right. So a large number of governments around the world uh, initiated relief programs, be it for families or for small businesses. Uh, the World Bank uh, is putting together a paper I, I just saw and they mentioned some 80 efforts, <clears throat> distinct efforts, large scale efforts around the world. And I think it's fair to say that in those places where there was a modern public digital infrastructure, and that includes payments, but it goes beyond payments to include identity, data availability, et cetera. It's fair to say that those countries who had that type of infrastructure could do a better job. Uh, so India, for example, in April, in a time span of uh, some 10 days, reached uh, more than 100 million people at the margin of society in the informal economy. And they reached them with relief payments with a click of a button because India has the famous India stack public digital infrastructure, identity, payment switch, et cetera. We can talk more about that. Other places were not so lucky. And uh, the, the US where uh, I am right now and where I live, and I think the previous speaker uh, uh, in the conference actually alluded to that as well. I caught the tail end. In the US, it took uh, three to three months for individual checks to go out. And uh, some people are still waiting. And we send checks to folks who had deceased uh, uh, and, uh, and others that were not el eligible. 
So yes, the, the, the infrastructure that was in place at the time has made a big difference in government ability to respond appropriately to the crisis. Thank you, Tillman. Uh, Musa? You need to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for the question. Um, for us in Nigeria, we've, um, the government had actually embarked on several initiatives that leverages on the payment system. Um, before this time, before the COVID, there was this program that the government runs called the Conditional Cash Transfer, where they pay you know, uh, monthly allowances to the poor. And what they basically leverage on is to use the mobile money to deliver those financial services. Um, when the pandemic came, it was very obvious you know, that the only means by which payment can actually be delivered to people was to use electronic means of payment. Cash, nobody wanted to touch cash. As a matter of fact, nobody actually wanted to touch even physical you know, uh, payment devices. So everybody was doing transfer. And so one of the requirements you know, that, was that, that we needed to have for those in the rural communities or those that were badly affected was for them to have bank accounts. Uh, unfortunately, the infrastructure for enrolling and getting everyone into the financial services isn't that available, which is why, as a country, we embark on a financial inclusion strategy. Uh, we've been on this strategy for a long time, trying to see how we can get more than 80% of Nigerians into the banking sector. So the payment system basically provides the underlying framework through which you know uh, the economic agents can actually transact in Nigeria. And a major use case during the COVID was this palliative and the relief you know uh, fund that was to be distributed to those that qualify to have that. Now, one of the major challenges that we faced within the payment system in getting these things sorted out was the issue of telecommunication infrastructure. Uh, people in rural communities do not have access, the kind of digital access we have within the cities. And so having a vast network of agent outlets and making sure that our payment and our communication infrastructure is very pervasive and resilient is one of the major you know, deterrent to our payment system here. The other one is identity problem. Everyone in Nigeria needs to be uniquely identified so that we can actually be sure that when payments are being made, it is being sent to the right recipient. And so we embark on a national program of you know, uh, registering all Nigerians and issuing the national identity number. That is also one of the projects that we have also embarked on. By the time we resolve the issue of identity and solve some of the common infrastructure problems, uh, I think Nigeria will be you know, very strong in terms of making payment system the underlying infrastructure for delivering financial services in Nigeria. Thank you, Musa. Uh, Andrea? Yeah, actually, I just want to touch on something Musa said because I wholeheartedly agree with him. Digital ID is absolutely key um, for inclusion. Um, and actually, and, and, and not also um, people's perception of this in emerging markets, actually, you know, quite frankly, Michael, in our own markets, in the US and UK, which we're considered um, very mature market, it would help our market significantly um, if digital ID was in place. But to go back to your question, because I'm, I'm diverting and I don't want to waylay this whole um, this whole conference. But you know, we have quite a mature um, payments infrastructure in the UK. I think it's fair to say. But there were a couple of issues that I think really come to mind that, that's occurred and and still ongoing now during COVID. Um, one was um, the ability for, um, for businesses, particularly small businesses, to gain access to the government loans. Um, you know, you know, and I'm guessing it's no different probably in the US. Um, you know, that has been a challenging process. Many businesses struggling to get access to the money. I think on the consumer side, uh, I think that's been less of a case. But I think what COVID has highlighted um, to myself and, and many people um, in the payments industry is probably how many more vulnerable um, um, people that we had in the UK that we didn't fully appreciate. There's been a massive drive in many markets to a cashless society. And when COVID hit, you know, we have um, a significant amount of people that, you know, may have bank accounts, but withdraw cash and like to spend in cash for a number of reasons. 
and um, and we had a lot of um, vulnerable elderly people that were um you know segregating and isolating at home and um, that proved challenging on actually how do they go out and get their their food pay for their bills um and, and there were some interesting innovations that came off that you know there were companion cards created by starling bank um to give to other people that you could load funds onto that those um you know you know more vulnerable people could still um enable other people to go and buy goods for but one of the aspects that's really challenging around all of this is it still comes back to people being um literate around it technology understanding how to load these cards how to manage these um products online and believe it or not we still have a massive gap in the uk around this and um, we also have a digital gap um and and and, and no dissimilar to um, nigeria um, I think we still have, I think it's about 25, 23%, something like that, that struggle to get access to broadband here in the UK, which when you're in lockdown kind of compounds some of these challenges, um, you know, that we saw and made people that were already vulnerable, probably even more vulnerable um, through this process. So I, I, I think there's a lot of lessons learned for us in the UK is how do we go forward um, with our, our payments infrastructure and our systems in the future and start to take into account all of society, not just a, a certain percentage of society, which I think is what's happened here in the UK, unfortunately. Uh, thanks, Andrea, that's uh, really helpful. Uh, we're gonna dig a little uh, deeper into the question of um, who ought to run the payment system whether that's the private sector, the public sector, multiple private sector entities, um, and the like. Maybe Musa, you could uh, start us out. Um, how does the Central Bank of Nigeria think about the question, what kinds of aspects of the payment system should be run by the Central Bank itself? What should be regulated by the Central Bank? How do you think about these questions? Well, um for me, I think running the payment infrastructure should actually be private, you know, uh, driven. It, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be run by the central bank. It shouldn't be, be run by any regulatory, you know, authority. As a regulator, we are supposed to provide the guidelines, the directives, the environment that makes you know all the participants to try very well to work symbiotically. And so, to be an arbiter, you then need to take your hand of running any specific you know payment infrastructure and that's basically the kind of the kind of configuration we have in nigeria the central bank doesn't run any payment infrastructure aside the rtgs the real-time growth settlement system apart from that every other payment infrastructure is being run by banks and by private entities and fintechs central bank doesn't or it's not an operator it's a regulator and that's the kind of configuration we have in nigeria that makes you know competition very smooth and symbiotic so Musa, in Nigeria, uh, the bank-to-bank -bank network for real-time settlement is run by the Central Bank of Nigeria, but all the yes. other payments infrastructure is run by the private sector. Yes, the RTGS has been run uh, by the Central Bank because that's where the net settlement you know, ends up. The banks all connect Central Bank to settle the obligations after transactions have been cleared. And so we maintain the RTGS. Every other payment infrastructure is being operated by the, the operators, the banks, the payment service providers, and the fintechs. And Musa, what's the competitive landscape for the private sector? Is there real competition for payment services or are the different providers operating in different um, sectors of the payment system? Well, um, we, basically what we have done is to segment uh, our payment system into different compartments. And so what we did is to, you know, get them different kinds of authorization so for example switching switching is very very important because it connects all the banks together and all the other payment you know, service providers together. we have specific licenses for entities who can switch and we give the guidelines upon which those switching services can be provided and so we also have some agent banking you know activities that are regulated we also have card issuance and acquiring that are regulated. so they are also segmented into different authorization categories what the central bank basically does is to provide the framework, the enabling framework, that makes all these entities to connect and interoperate. And so I would say largely it is private sector driven, 
with the regulator only mediating to make sure that there is you know proper conduct within the ecosystem. Thanks. Um, Tillman, how do you think about these questions? I would probably take two lenses. <clears throat> the first one is a bit first principles, if you will. I think you would want to think through a financial system and say what is underlying, what is public good in nature and probably should be government provided. And both Musa and Andrea mentioned identity uh, as, as, uh, as a key element. And I would think in many countries that should be a public good. It is related to both the, the civil registry, etc. cetera. Um, then comes the question of what is a utility in nature? And I probably would argue that payments, in particular retail payments, have a utility characteristic. Uh, they have network externalities. So frankly, they might be natural monopolies. Uh, and then you can think about what should, uh, where, where should we have public sector, public good, utility type characteristics, and where do we want the private sector to compete? And I think an ideal system would be one where there is the lowest possible systems cost, no duplication, uh, and where the private sector competes at the application layer. Uh, so that's my first lens, sort of a principal lens. And I'm an economist by training, as you probably can hear from that answer. I would then pragmatically use a second lens, which is to say, what is there in the country already? What to build on? Nobody starts from scratch when it comes to these type of things. Uh, and, and, and when it comes to specifically uh, uh, retail payments or the payment utility, it could be run by a consortium, a nonprofit consortium, uh, of uh, private sector players. It could be run by a public player. If it is run by the private sector, it should be probably regulated as a utility. Interoperability should be mandated, the type of things that, that Musa already alluded to. And I, I suspect that the majority of countries actually have some such a, a approach. And certainly the higher performing ones from a cost and, 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 and real-time settlement perspective. So when, when I looked at these things, the Netherlands, Canada, and the emerging, in the highly advanced economies were all run as sort of consortium of private sector players under public regulation. In emerging markets, there's conceivably a bigger role for government or even the central bank, bank to run more of the operations because they have the capacity to do so. But the answer really depends on the country and its starting point. Thanks, Tillman. Uh, Andrea, how do you think about this question? Yes, I mean, I, you know, in, in, in UK and Europe, um, you know, I think we've been really fortunate with some of the regulation that's opened up the market. And the aim of that regulation was to enable more, um, more competition into the market. Um, because I guess, you know, um, <laughs> to Tillman's point, um, there, there could be a, a monopoly aspect around how the market has, has operated previously. Um, I think now with um, open banking and the rise of open banking, um, I really see some you know, really exciting times ahead. And I think the benefit of this, off the back of this, is ultimately going to be for the consumer. So I think, you know, with um, the new technology that's come in, um, with a lot of the fintechs, uh, and also actually many of the banks as well, a lot of the banks have upped their game um, with all the new regulation that's come in, that there's much more consumer lens on um, payments products. So the whole experience that consumers have, um, you know, can be, um, you know, much more um, customized than I think how we were operating previously um, in more of a, a card payment world. I think open banking opens up so much more possibilities. And I think this is really exciting for um, UK, Europe, Australia now. Um, I think they went in January. Um, you're seeing other markets embark on the same um, journey that we've all been on. So um, yeah, I, 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 I think there are exciting times ahead in this space, but there's no lack of competition. Um, you know, I think in, in the UK market or the European market, they're, they're pretty thriving um, over here in this space. Andrea, for our listeners who don't know about the UK's Open Banking Initiative, do you mind just describing the basic structure? It's so yeah. different from what we have in the United States and, and in many other countries. Yeah, uh, so, uh, the model. 
Yeah, so um, and, and ba basically when you look at the, the original end-to-end -end model of card payments, you'd have the, um, the uh, consumer, the issuer, um, the card schemes, um, um, the merchant acquirer, a gateway, um, before you get to the end bank account. And um, the advantage of um, open banking is it rides on, in the US, ACH rails. Um, you know, we would call it faster payments over here. And it really enables um, 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 payment companies, payment initiation companies to um, initiate payments straight out of a consumer's bank account to pay um, the pay the payer, the payee. Um, it's a very simple process um, without all the layers in between. Um, it removes a lot of the friction. So if you have um, a good example would be like a, an invoicing model, um, the payments can be embedded into the invoice, pull straight directly from your bank account, straight to the person that you're trying to pay in, and it does it all in real time. The advantage for businesses that makes this really, really attractive is it can be instant liquidity for them. So they're getting paid quickly. And as we all know, many companies are really struggling on um, getting bills paid um, in a timely manner. That's a massive issue and has been for a long time. Um, so they get instant payment. And then on top of that, actually, there isn't a lot of the um, level of um, chargeback and fraud aspects um, that we see traditionally in card payments. So there's a lot of benefits to that from using these rails. And then the biggest benefit of all to businesses, to merchants, is really the cost. Um, the cost is significantly lower um, for utilizing these rails, um, uh, you know, uh, on more, um, you know, mid to high value payments. Um, for lower payments, you could still say um, a card would make sense, but for, as, the, as the values start rising, um, open banking just makes much more sense for some of these. So I think we see um, a lot of disintermediation um, will come in the future around these rails. You know, definitely. Um, thanks, Andrea. Um, Tillman, I know you've done a lot of thinking about the evolution of the payment system around the world over time. I'm wondering if you could help our audience understand or give a perspective on that evolution. Where have we been and where do you think we're going in, in payment systems? Yeah, you know, I think one one observation that might resonate with with all of you is 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 the following at some it's at some level technology new technologies when they arrive they hit a system in in a market structure and industry structure in its current form and 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 and, and they, we have seen massive explosion of innovation and it really from from maybe relevant for today's discussion on the payment retail payment side started with a 2g feature phone and mpesa famously in in east africa because the 2g feature phone had this unutilized channel for unstructured data the ussd channel and folks realized well we can transfer value over that and 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 that took off uh, because there was relative white space, uh, white space, and the regulator in Kenya was willing to let that experimentation happen. Now, that was helped by the fact that Safaricom, as the telco operator, had a dominant market share, so there was no interoperability issue. It kept prices higher. In neighboring Tanzania, there are four operators, and when interoperability kicked in, right, fees for consumers or for senders and receivers became much lower. Then came the 3G and smartphone revolution, if you will, and it was really picked up in particular by the Chinese ecosystems. Um, they used the, the new technology, but they still built a walled garden uh, on financial Alipay on one side with a billion users by now, WeChat uh, on the other side. It's a duopoly, if you will. And, and there's a real opportunity now to leapfrog all of that and, and, and put these principles in place that we discussed earlier. If there is an interoperable architecture from a payment system perspective, and if there is open data from, from, a, from an access to data perspective, the, 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 the dimension that Andrea covered, a modern payment, a modern system can be faster, cheaper, uh, less risky for everybody. 
And emerging markets have a real chance to leapfrog into that. In the US, we are stuck uh, for much of our day-to-day -day payments with, with the old card networks and card-based use. And that costs for the credit card still 2.2% or some such thing on average, and for the debit card 1.2% on average of transaction. The cost could be much, much, much lower than that. And, and India and others are proving that where the cost for a transaction is cents on the thousand dollars as opposed to percents, right? Uh, as we observe it still in many other places. Um, excellent, uh, excellent point, Tillman. Um, Musa, as, as you see this competitive landscape in Nigeria develop, how did the central bank go about thinking about whether to regulate non-banks and how to regulate non-banks in that space? Yeah, um, I think, you know, regulating entities within the payment system has always been a major concern for all, you know, regulators. And in our own case, you know, the incursion of the fintechs into the payment space actually pose a great challenge for central bank. Uh, we're trying to balance, you know, allowing innovation to thrive and managing the risk that these you know, uh, innovators brings to bear. And so um, the approach that we have taken is to allow innovation to come out first, and then we try to do, you know, put the brakes in between by putting regulations and guidelines on what to do. And so some of the actions that we have taken recently, basically to promote fintech, was to launch the regulatory sandbox, in, in which case, you know, we allow the fintechs to come and play around with the ideas and see whether they work in order to drive you know, the financial inclusion in the country and in order to facilitate, you know, payment services. So that is one of the actions that we have taken. Uh, just like Andre said, we are in Nigeria, we are also pursuing the concept of open banking, where in our own case, uh, we, we've actually ramped up on instant payment. Instant payment is not, is not something new in Nigeria. It actually happens instantly. Now, what we're trying to do now is to allow the new entities, the small companies, the financial technology companies that are coming up, to also now participate fully by playing the middleman, you know, role. And so that's why we are also trying to drive, you know, open banking concepts and, and all that. But beyond that, uh, we, we have a regime in Nigeria where, you know, our payment system directives and guidelines usually don't just happen within the central banks. What we do is to have ecosystem arrangement, ecosystem discussion, and find out what exactly works for Nigeria. Payment system, is not um it's, it's very pervasive it's worldwide but what we try to do is to domesticate it and find out what happens and what works for nigeria and that's why in coming out with our regulations we always invite and involve all the major stakeholders including other regulatory agencies for example agencies that regulate the telecommunication industry agencies that ensure you know the depositors fund in, in the bank they are all brought together for us to reason and find out you know the balances in all these regulatory agencies and come up with a policy that makes the financial system, you know, work. So for us, we allow innovation to come up and then we follow it up with regulation that makes market conduct very smooth. Um, thanks, Musa. That's um, uh, that's really helpful. Um, Andrea, how are the Europeans thinking about uh, this question of the regulatory perimeter for payments? You know what what is um, what's covered by uh, by the regulatory infrastructure? What's left out? Have people tried uh, sandbox approaches like the one that Musa is describing in Nigeria? What do you think has been successful and not successful in that space in Europe? Yes, I mean we we, we also have a sandbox, and I think um, I think it's been very successful. I think we're really fortunate um, in our market that we've got quite a progressive um, regulator. And I think that's really helped the um, non-bank market really develop really well. Um, I'm not saying it's not we're not without our challenges, but what I do think has happened probably in the last five years is the regulatory approach has really cha has really changed. So um, it's not just the, the supervisory style it's a much more open and engaged regulator that works um, with companies around supervision um, and, and has a very much more of a consultative approach um, to the non-bank sector. 
So, you know, I mean, there'll always be issues because inherently you can't um, open up um, the sector and there, there won't be unintended consequences. Of course there are. Um, but I think what, what's great is that our regulator actually does work with us. And I think that's the case pretty much um, across most of the countries in Europe, which is why I think it's been pretty much thriving across Europe in this state, the non-banks. But what I, what I would say as well, though, is that I think the non-banks that have come in and added particular um, specialism and very niche products um, within financial services, I do think that has upped the game for the banks. And I, I personally feel in the probably last 18 months, um, I think the um, banks have moved much strongly more forward with much more of a consumer led approach, um, which I think historically have been lacking. So I think there's been a benefit on both sides. You know, we all partner with the banks and, you know, I, you know, I, I run a regulated entity myself. Um, you know, you partner with the banks and you collaborate with them. Um, but equally, I, th I think there's benefits on both sides um, as to the different types of services that we bring. It's, it's much more complementary um, than, than maybe people think. Thanks, Andrea. Tillman, I wanted to return to the, one of the issues you posed about uh, competition. If we have network externalities in payment systems and they tend towards a natural monopoly, what is the what are the kind of minimum requirements necessary to have a functioning payment system with real meaningful competition for providing payment services? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the starting point is is the one that you are describing, uh, which is right. There are network externalities. If if um, I can easily pay somebody else and there are more folks out there, right? There's a utility coming to that. And frankly, that, that phenomenon is, is accelerated now uh, with, um, with the situation that we are living in, right? COVID and economic lockdown has, is changing the ways we try to make a living, the way we shop, the way we socialize. We do conferences like this uh, 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 online. And so new platforms that are important in our lives are gaining uh, relevance. And that's why regulators are struggling with this notion of how to deal with these new platforms, for example. And, and by the way, I have a great sympathy for regulators. Regulators are concerned about the stability of the system, the integrity of the system. Uh, they want to consu uh, protect consumers and they want an inclusive system and they have to balance all these type of things. And when it comes to payment systems, I would go back to the first principle of saying they ought to be interoperable. They sh ought to be real time. It should be push any account to any account. Um, so you should probably regulate by, well, design by these principles and then regulate activities like-to-like uh, -like activities as opposed to different institutions being regulated differently because of their legal status. I realize I remain a bit at the sort of abstract level, but I do think that's your starting point. And then each country and each regulator has to think through what does that mean for our context. Um, and then the private sector can build on that. Once there is certainty around these things, the private sector will come in and will figure out better better solutions that ultimate ultimately benefit all people our 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 regulatory setup though does need a refresh right a lot of these things in in immature countries like the us were written in the 90s often in reaction to crises before the iphone was uh, invented and and so they just don't take into account these new opportunities and possibilities that we have and the new risks that also have arisen. So we do need a refresh there. Thanks, Tillman. Um, I have uh, one or two um, additional questions for the panel, and then I'm, in a moment, I'm going to turn to the audience questions. Uh, Musa, you touched on this very briefly in your opening remark, but I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you think about the last mile problem, that last moment between the, the payment um, system and a merchant or between peers and peers 
Is there a merchant access problem that you have found or have you uh, figured out how to solve? Are there last mile issues that you've had to overcome in Nigeria that would be helpful for others to hear about? Yeah, um, it, it's something that is still ongoing, uh, quite ongoing. And so there are several approaches to it from regulator and then from the operator, including even the government support to resolving those last mile problems. Now, one of the ways by which, you know, we, we are approaching this is to deploy massive, you know, agent outlets uh, to make sure that, you know, uh, we, we keep financial touch points closer to the uh, underbank and then the underserved and all that. Now, how do we get this done? We can't run a payment system without very efficient telecommunication infrastructure. That is very, very important. Because that's the only way people get connected to the internet or at least connected onto the network and all that. So what we've done as a regulator was to come up with a licensing regime that allows telecommunication companies in Nigeria to take uh, a kind of authorization called super agent, where they can actually deploy and leverage on the existing footprint that they have in, in rural communities, you know, to provide financial touch points. So they could actually turn their customer, you know, outlets wherever they already have signals, masks, and all that, they could actually convert them to financial touch points. And so we are approaching it from that to make sure that we have, you know, uh, provide digital access to the nooks and crannies of Nigeria. On the other hand, um, building agent outlets is also very expensive, uh, especially when you move towards the rural communities because you need to, uh, you know, solve the problem of power. You need to solve the problem of security and all of that. And so it becomes very expensive to actually deploy agent outlets in those nooks and crannies. And so what with this, the, the, the central bank and the committee of banks called the Bankers Committee had done was to provide a pool of funds that these agents and super agents can actually use to build these agent outlets at a very cheap cost. So we also support the super agents with, with financial support so that they can go into the hinterland and build the agent outlets. So why the telecommunication companies are building, you know, networks, lane fibers, and providing digital access across the country, the central bank and the bankers' committees are providing funds that is needed to build these, you know, merchant outlets, cash in, cash out outlets in the rural communities. That's basically what we are trying to do, and hoping that by the end of this year, we are targeting to have, a, you know, well over half a million agent outlets in Nigeria that will enable, you know, uh, the underserved and the underbank to have financial touch points. And Musa, are you providing direct cash liquidity to the super agents or is that through the banks? No, through the banks. Through, through the, the banks. banks. Okay. Yeah, they, uh, each, each, each super agent will apply through its bank to access that fund. Um, Great. Let me um, let me turn to some uh, some audience questions, and then I'll uh, have a few final questions at the end. Um, Andrea, let me ask you. Um, there's a question from the audience. The progress of fintech companies is often constrained by their need to partner with a bank that has access to central bank payment systems. Should central banks expand payment access to fintech companies? So it is true, um, many fintechs are constrained by this and do need to use banking partners. But a couple of years ago in the UK, um, between the regulator and the Bank of England, we did actually open up um, access to a central bank. So we have a number of fintechs now that are connected into the Bank of England and um, carry out direct clearing. Um, and I think that has started to have a, a, a really good impact um, in the UK on the services that can be offered outside of kind of, you know, the core main banks. What I would say is that I think that this isn't necessarily an easy step for a central bank to take. I think that for central banks to start to open up to um, fintechs, um, to a wider system can, um, you know, could open up some additional risks that maybe weren't considered in the beginning. So I think there's a I think this is the challenge for central banks and the future for them is just looking at um, how do they how do they move forward? How do they move with the expectations of, of the market? Um, how do they keep pace with technology um, when they're trying to maintain a, you know, a very stable system supporting our core infrastructure? So I think this is a really tough one for them. And in the UK, you're probably aware of this anyway. 
Um, we are going through um, um, a program of work to upgrade our real-time system um, so that actually it's fit for tomorrow. Um, but this isn't something that can be done overnight. And I think this is the challenge is that fintechs expect everything to happen tomorrow and are terribly impatient. Um, and when you embark on a program with someone like the Bank of England to be onboarded into the central bank, this isn't a two week project. It's not a couple of agile sprints and you're in. Um, there's a lengthy process. So, you know, you're, you're probably looking at probably a 12 month process. You know, it could even be more. But with the bank on the verge of this massive technology uplift, you know, to provide services for the future, I do think there'll probably be a knock on impact to fintechs in the UK while we go through this transition. So we've got the first few in, which is great. And we can see what the future can start to look like. But, um, you know, we've still got a way to go to get our national infrastructure where we need it to, to really adapt to the future. And I guess that's the challenge for central banks all around the world right now is how do they open up? You know, how do they develop their tech and future proof it for the future? And then how do they manage the additional risks of bringing these players into the central infrastructure? Uh, thanks, Andrea. Um, Tillman, uh, maybe you could take this one. There's a question from the audience. Why is improving cross-border payments such a difficult problem? Are the challenges primarily technical, legal, or financial? If you look at different corridors, <clears throat> remittances corridors, cross-border, again, I'm on the retail side of things. Things have changed quite dramatically, right? So if you have environments where in both country A and country B, there's clarity around the know your customer requirements. Um, if everybody has essentially digital access, uh, either via account or wallet, etc., then cross-border transfers can be very uh, 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 easy, relatively cheap and fast. And this is happening. And, and you don't need blockchain and Bitcoin or any some such thing for that, right? You just need to modernize <laughs> your, your, the, the age old system that is in place. Uh, and for busy corridors, that has happened. Um, my sense is this will accelerate quite rapidly. The big cost in, 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 in domestic, uh, international remittances is still cash in, cash out, right? You need somebody to take the money in and then the last mile, somebody needs to be able to take it out. Musa spoke about that. As countries on both sides uh, do away with that need because the entire retail payment system digitizes, there could also be a, an easy way to connect. Um, as long as there is reciprocity in regulation and 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 uh, and, uh, and and approaches, this is happening and will happen and will accelerate. Tillman, do you think that the evolution of that system will um, disintermediate the correspondent banking system or use that system? It will. It's a bit speculative, obviously. It will certainly take out a couple of layers, right? I mean, if you go all the way back, how did this start? It started hundreds of years ago, right? When, when you needed trusted intermediate banks and you were a merchant in Italy and you had your merchant banker who connected you and who had some connections to New York and, and that banker in New York had some connections to, uh, to Pick your, pick your place, right? There was this layer of correspondent banks because they needed to create the trust that trade could happen, what have you, right? The, it, 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 it was a trust-based system that required uh, this type of correspondent banking layers. You can take out a lot of that when things are real-time, digital, and, and settlement is happening pretty much instantaneously, right? There's less trust needed, if you will. There is no settlement risk. Uh, it will become cheaper for everybody. And yes, we can take out intermediate layers. Uh, Musa, this question might be um, to you. Um, how should central bankers think about the scope of a regulatory sandbox? Are all financial activities appropriate for a sandbox? if they're limited enough in the number of people that they reach? That's the audience question. Well, um, this is a very tricky one. I, I think 
uh, the, we can have one answer to all uh, the various implementation by the various central banks. Uh, you, with the objective of the regulatory sandbox basically is to encourage innovation, and those innovations should meet economic needs and all that. So I think the limits, you know, to what can be uh, uh, played out within the regulatory sandbox depends on the economic objective that, you know, the central bank or the government is trying to solve or the kind of innovation that they are looking for. In our own case, for example, financial inclusion is very dear to our hearts. And we see how we can lower the industry cost to serve. So we are looking at creative solutions that can actually lower cost of service. We are looking at creative solutions that can be used you know, to provide services to areas where you don't have strong connectivity. So offline payment, for example, is something that would be welcome as an innovation to be played within the regulatory sandbox. So um, as a central bank, what we've done is to limit, you know, the qualification criteria to objectives that actually meet the economic need of Nigeria, the one that promotes innovation, areas that have not been touched. Those are the kind of things, you know, and boundaries that are set, including the fact that, um, since we're going to run this in cohorts, uh, we can only take as much as our capacity can take. So we can basically, you know, take on everyone that applies, you know, anytime we open a cohort. But basically, I think the limiting factor should be the underlying, underlying objective of meeting certain economic need or solving any particular problem that the country is faced with. Thanks, Musa. That's, um, that's really helpful. And I do think that, you know, the there's so much nuance that's needed depending on the particular government structure and private sector structure in each country. That's absolutely critical to, to sorting through what makes sense in that context. Um, the, next, um, the next question from the audience is, what role should central banks play in promoting the advancement of open banking? And maybe I'll ask Tillman and Andrea, maybe Tillman, if you could talk a little bit about the India stack experience. And Andrea, you could talk a little bit about the UK experience. That'll give the audience a flavor for different approaches to, to this problem. So the India stack and the language comes from the technology world. The, the India stack really at its basis has the unique identity, biometric, unique identity, 10 fingerprints, two iris scans, and that, as we discussed earlier, is a, is a, is a public good. The government provided it. Uh, then, very importantly, right, financial regulators obviously had to make sure that the use of this identity, it's called ADA, uh, that that actually is permissible or is good enough, if you will, for KYC and other purposes. If, if the financial regulators didn't recognize ADA as sufficient, then it would not work. So that's the second element of the stack, if you will, is an, is an entire notion of regulations um, uh, around the use of the identity, including for consent and doing away with the requirement for wet signatures, these type of things. These are all the little things that can take inefficiencies out of the system. And then on top of that, uh, there is the payment layer. Uh, and we talked about that a bit. It's the National Payment Corporation of India, which is, is jointly owned uh, by a dozen plus banks in, in the country. And the central bank is the Reserve Bank of India is very much part of these deliberations. And it essentially nudged the system towards adopting an open architecture type uh, approach to payments. And, and that led to this ability of any account to any account. There was an insistence that at the, at the beginning of a transaction and at the receiving end ought to be a regulated account um, that is properly KYC'd, et cetera. But all sorts of efforts were made to make that easier. And, uh, and uh, the, the notion of then the data layer, who owns what da data as a consumer or as a small business, um, to whom can whom to whom can you provide access as far as your data is concerned? That's the next important element. I think this is the data layer is actually something that we often forget, um, in particular in emerging in the emerging market context. There's at least a billion consumers who don't have a FICO score or any such equivalent. The vast majority of small businesses operate in emerging markets operate under some notion or in some to some degree of informality. 
but the underlying lies are digitizing either in the supply chain or in the in the distribution chain so there's more and more data available that allows for example for credit underwriting that banks traditionally could not have done so the data layer and driving uh, driving accessibility and, 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 pro and giving users control over their data. That's a very, very important piece to unlock the economic upside. And that can be done by the regulator, but it can also be done by private sector initiatives around API infrastructures and the voluntary, if you will, cooperation. If everybody realizes, wow, the pie could become bigger if we all open up, then there is a win-win situation conceivably. Mm -hmm. Um, Tillman, that, that's, that's right. I wonder whether, I haven't looked at the economics of this, but whether the, if you really do an open API is the pie, the pie is bigger for society, but is it bigger for the incumbents is a different question. That is true. Somebody's efficiency gain is somebody else's revenue loss. And yeah. that's why we need the nudge. Uh, and as society and as regulators, I see Musa smiling, we should absolutely give that nudge. I mean, um, I, add, I add one piece in, in for the US, Michael, that people might not know. So I mentioned earlier that the average credit card transaction costs 2.2%. Relatively little goes to the networks. Most goes to the issuing banks, uh, 2%. And then the issuing bank credit card gives half of us, half of that 2% back to all of us in forms of cash back, or it used to be Myers, remember those days. Uh, debit card or uh, uh, transaction cost 1.2%. Cash obviously has no cost for the merchant or less cost for the merchant. Merchants don't discriminate anymore. They used to, right? You used to go to a gas station, get a better price if you use cash. That's gone. Everybody pays the same price, which de facto means that relatively lower income households, because they disproportionately use cash or debit card, actually subsidize my credit card rewards. That's just not okay. The Federal Reserve Bank in Boston has estimated uh, the, the, the value of that uh, uh, annual subsidy, if you will. It runs in the thousands of dollars per, per family in the US. Excellent point, Tillman. We're, um, uh, we're getting close to the hour. Let me let Andrea, if you wanna say more about, you talked a little bit about UK open banking before. Are there other aspects that you want to highlight in terms of the central bank's role in, in pushing that? Um, the only thing I would add to that is that actually we, um, our, ours was a little bit more um, government led. So I think to Tillman's point, um, you know, um, th there needs to be, a, I think, a mandate from the top to really open this up amongst the um, big banks. Interestingly, we created a separate entity, which is called the OBIE, um, which has really led open banking for the last few years. And um, they're actually overseen by the Competitions Market Authority. I don't know if that structure is occurring anywhere else um, in the world, but I find that quite an interesting structure that we chose to go down that path rather than putting it directly under a regulator. Um, everyone is very engaged. The regulators are obviously part of the discussion and everything else. But it is interesting that it is the, the CMA that really oversees this. So, and I think that's about, you know, ensuring that we're driving that competition in the market and ensuring that actually open banking actually stands a chance of being a success here in the UK. Musa, you were, uh, as um, Tillman said, smiling before about the nudge. How much of a nudge did you need to give to the Nigerian private sector to move forward on um, issues like interoperability and open banking? Well, um I think we, for, for us, like, just like I said, the, the, the payment system here is driven likely, you know, by the private sector. There are individual companies that run this kind of thing. And what we try to do is to create a, an environment where it is a win-win. And so um, we we are working towards establishing, um, uh, as we speak, we basically, to some degree, regulate or put a cap on pricing, you know, simply because we have a financial inclusion agenda. So we try to, you know, put a seal on how much you can charge the consumers because if truly we are promoting financial inclusion, of which one of the major deterrents is high cost of financial services, then we need to put a seal on that. 
But we are trying to promote interchange. And with interchange, it means it will just basically the acquirer and the issuers trying to promote, you know, uh, efficiency in the payment system. And so what the merchant actually charges the customer, or sorry, what the merchant charges the customer or what the acquirer charges the merchant is, has nothing to do with regulation. It is not priced, it is not fixed. It is basically, you know, uh, through the bargaining power. And, and by that, I think investors will actually see the opportunity, you know, to um, get a very high return on their investment. And because competition will basically, you know, drive price down, and with improved services, you get more numbers in, into the system. So for us, it's going to be an open market where we allow the private sector institutions to basically determine what price is good, you know, for for their system, and to also drive volume, you know, for the services that they provide. Thank you. Um, I might ask uh, each of you um, to say. If you had to pick one game changer, a technological development or a policy framework that's a real game changer in terms of advancing financial inclusion through the payment system, what would it be? And maybe I'll, I'll start uh, with Andrea and then Musa and Tillman. Oh, do you mean a, a, a current one or a future one? Either, either way, what, something that you think is right on the cusp of making a big difference or one that you anticipate in the future uh, would be a game changer. Yeah, I mean, the game changer for me is digital ID, 100%. That's the game changer for financial inclusion, I'm afraid, for, for all of our countries. Thanks, Andrea. Musa? And, and I, think, I think it goes for everyone. You know, uh, feminine digital identity is very, very key. Trying, you know, trying to know every single individual, and using that as an authorization means is very key, and, and that's a major challenge that we face now. So our major policy directive focuses on, you know, digital identification in Nigeria. That's great, uh, Tillman. Probably depends very much on the country. Um, in the U.S. right now, I. I think we could make a big difference on the retail payment side if we just made sure the underlying infrastructure was open 24-7, 365, which is not the case for the Fedwire. Um, we could also mandate immediate funds availability so people don't have to wait. So there's statutory authority in the US to make a real difference, very, very pragmatic, uh, immediately doable. If you step back at the systemic level, I very much sympathize with Andreas' point around digital identity as, as a foundational element. And, and I think the one thing that we do have to all wrestle with is this phenomenon of finance, starting with payments, but quickly going to the other dimensions of finance on the retail side being embedded in the big tech platforms. They have the customers, they have the data, they have the brand, they have uh, uh, the connectivity by definition. Uh, India just allowed WhatsApp to start embed payments into the app. 400 million Indians use it on a daily basis. That could take off very, very quickly. And it raises all sorts of promises. <laughs> on the inclusion side, and it raises all sorts of new issues on the competition, new risk side. And so we have to wrestle with that. Thanks, Tillman. Uh, we are gonna have a discussion later today and tomorrow around uh, the role of Facebook and Libra and oh, okay. Good. the big tech <laughs> platforms as part of our conversations. I think it is, uh, raises critically interesting questions. Uh, we are, um, uh, basically at the hour, let me just um, thank each of you for your insightful contributions um, to our discussion uh, and uh, really learned a lot um, from our conversation. I know our audience uh, did as well. Our audience, um, thank you for joining us. If we didn't get to your particular question today, um, uh, hopefully you'll hear more about it uh, throughout the course of the conference. So uh, those of you who are watching, uh, please join me in thanking my wonderful panel. Thank you. Take care, everybody.